My name is Joan Bryant. I'm reading from Toni Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye. Quiet as it's kept, there were no marigolds in the fall of 1941. We thought at the time that it was because Pecola was having her father's baby that the marigolds did not grow. A little examination and much less melancholy would have proved to us that our seeds were not the only ones that did not sprout. Nobody's did. Not even the gardens fronting the lake showed marigolds that year. But so deeply concerned were we with the health and safe delivery of Pecola's baby, we could think of nothing but our own magic. If we had planted the seeds and said the right words over them, they would blossom and everything would be all right. It was a long time before my sister and I admitted to ourselves that no green was going to spring from our seeds. Once we knew, our guilt was relieved only by fights and mutual accusations about who was to blame. For years, I thought my sister was right. It was my fault. I'd planted them too far down in the earth. It never occurred to either of us that the earth itself might have been unyielding. We had dropped our seeds in our own little plot of black dirt, just as Pecola's father had dropped his seeds in his own plot of black dirt. Our innocence and our faith were no more productive than his lust or despair. What is clear now is that all of all that hope, fear, lust, love, and grief, nothing remains but Pecola and the unyielding earth. Charlie Breed love is dead. Our innocence too. The seeds shriveled and died. Her baby too. There's really nothing more to say except why, but since why is difficult to handle, one must take refuge in how. Hi, I'm Devdul Bachi, and I'm reading from The Native Son by Richard Wright. Jan swung the car off the outer drive at 31st Street and drove westward to Indiana Avenue. Bigger wanted Jan to drive faster so that they could reach Ernie's kitchen shack in the shortest possible time. That would allow him a chance to sit in the car and stretch out his cramped and aching legs while they ate. Jan turned onto Indiana Avenue and headed south. Bigger wondered what Jack and Gus and G.H. would say if they saw him sitting between two white people in a car like this. They would tease him about such a thing as long as they could remember it. He felt Mary turn in her seat. She placed her hand on his arm. You know, Bigger, I've long wanted to go into those houses, she pointed. She said, pointing to the tall, dark apartment buildings looming to the either side of them and just see how people live. You know what I mean? I've been to England, France, and Mexico, but I don't know how people live 10 blocks from me. We know so little about each other. I just want to see. I want to know what these people, never in my life have I been inside of a Negro home, yet they must live like we live. They're human. There are 12 million of them and they live in our country, in the same city with us. Her voice trailed off wistfully. Hi, my name is Nicole Sarfo and today I'll be reading an excerpt from Sula by Toni Morrison on page 81. Along with a few other young black men, Jude had gone down to the shack where they were hiring. Three old colored men had already been hired, but not for the road work just to do the picking, food bringing, and other small errands. These old men were close to feeble, not good for much else, and everybody was pleased they were taken on. Still, it was a shame to see those white men laughing with their grandfathers, but shying away from the young black men who would tear that road up. The men like Jude who could do real work. Jude himself longed more than anyone else to be taken, not just for the good of the money, but for the work itself. He wanted to swing the pick or kneel down with the string or shovel the gravel. His arms ached for something heavier than trays, for something dirtier than peelings. His feet wanted the heavy work shoes, 
not the thin-soled black shoes that the hotel required. More than anything, he wanted the camaraderie of the roadmen, the lunch buckets, the hollering, the body movement that in the end produced something real, something he could point to. I built that road, he could say. How much better sundown would be than the end of a day in the restaurant, where a good day's work was marked by the number of dirty plates and the weight of the garbage bin. I built that road. People would walk over his sweat for years. Perhaps a sledgehammer would come crashing down on his foot, and when people asked him how he could limp, he would say, got that building, the new road. It was while he was full of such dreams, his body already feeling the rough work clothes, his hands already curved to the pick handle that he spoke to Neil about getting married. She seemed receptive, but already anxious. It was after he stood in line for six days running and saw the gang boss pick out thin armed white boys from the Virginia Hills and the bull neck Greeks and Italians and hurt over and over, nothing else today, come back tomorrow, that he got the message. It was rage, rage, and a determination to take on a man's role anyhow that made him press Neil about settling down. He seemed some of his appetite filled, some posture of adulthood recognized, but mostly he wanted someone to take care about his hurt, to care very deeply, deep enough to hold him, deep enough to rock him, deep enough to ask, how you feel? You all right? Want some coffee? And if he were to be a man that someone could no longer be his mother, he chose the girl who had always been kind, who had never seemed to be hell-bent to marry, who had made the whole venture seem like his idea, his conquest. Thank you. Hi, I'm gonna submit my Black in Band reading here. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to like read it out loud or just like record me reading it, like just like reading the physical thing, but I thought I'd read it out loud because that made more sense in my mind. So I'm gonna read The Liberator, December 31st, 1859. Seems pretty short. I might be a little over two minutes, but that's, I bought it, yeah. So here we go. Whereas we the oppressed portion of this community, may of whom, many of whom have have were the galling chain and felt the smarting lash of slavery and know by and organized its brutalizing efforts upon both the body and the mind and its damning influence upon the souls of its victims. And whereas we, by the help of Almighty God, have been enabled to make our escape from the prince house of slavery and partially to obtain our liberty, liberty, and having been personally acquainted with the life and character of our much beloved and highly esteemed friend, Captain John Brown, and his band of valiant men, who at Harper's Ferry on the 16th day of October, 1859, demonstrated to the world his sympathy with and fidelity to a cause of the suffering slaves of this country by bearding the hydra-headed monster in its den freely, delivering up his life today as a reason for our enslaved race, therefore be it. Resolved that we hold the name of Captain John Brown in the most sacred remembrance as the first disinterested martyr who, upon the true Christian principles of his divine Lord and Master, has freely delivered up his life for the liberty of our race in this country. Therefore, will we ever venerate his character and regard him as our temporal redeemer, who its name shall never die. Resolved that as the long last rights and liberties of an oppressed people are only gained in proportion as they act in our own cause. Therefore, are we now loudly called upon to arouse to own interests and to concentrate our efforts in keeping the old ground liberty ball in motion, thereby continues to kindle the fires of liberty upon the altar of every determined heart among us. Resolved that we tender our heartfelt sympathy to the family of Captain John Brown in their and reverent. Uh, and pledge to them that they shall ever be held by us as our special friends, in whose welfare we hope ever to manifest a deep interest. After the reading of the Declaration, the Maricel's hymn was sung. With soul-striving effect, able and eloquent speeches were made by Reverend Messers, Anderson, Green, Webb, and John D. Richards. After a general expression upon the Declaration, it was resolved that the several colored churches be dressed in mourning for 30 days, and that an appointment be made for the preaching of the funeral sermon of our much beloved friend, John Brown, within that time. Reverend Mr. Webb from the Finance Committee reported that the League had $25 on hand, ready to send to Mrs. Brown, with which, which would be forwarded to her. On motion, it was resolved that the proceedings of this meeting be presented to the city papers for publication, and that copies be sent to the several anti-slavery papers throughout the country, requesting them to publish the same adjourned, the same, adjourned to me on Friday evening, the 16th, the choir singing the patriotic song, on, on, to battle, we fear no foe. Hannibal Parker, 
etc. That was Liberator, and this is my submission. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Anthony Loicona, and I'm a freshman here at Syracuse, Professor Bryant's African American Literature course. Today, I'll be reading an excerpt from Paula Fox's The Slave Dancer. That night, I lay in my hammock, a sorry thing soaked through to its bones. All the hatches had been closed against the rain. The smell of wet wool stuffed my nostrils. The pickled cabbage I had had for my midday meal seemed to have reformed itself in my stomach. And finally, the thick mumble of complaint from Sharky and Isaac Porter, who were always arguing, drove me up on deck. The rain had abated. We were moving like an arrow, like a skyship among the points of lights, which were stars. I knew it must be Purvis on the watch, for while I was idly counting stars, a great wad of vile brown stuff flew by my ear as he expelled his gob of chewing tobacco over the side. I ducked and heard a dark chuckle, its human familiarity overcoming the sound of a speaking ship, the creaking mast, the great thunk and slap of the sails, the breathing sea. Perhaps the night in the sea leads a person to thoughts of his life. It did me. I thought about how the only pre grown people I'd really known up to now were women. I wouldn't count the parson, who was a stick notched with pious sayings, or the doctor at the charity hospital who treated my sister with tonics and ointments. And here, there were no females, save the captain's hens. I had not known that among men, there were such differences. That thought led me to wonder why I didn't like Benjamin Stout. I surprised myself. I hadn't known till that second that liking mattered. What had mattered before was how I was treated. And Stout treated me kindly, showing me things that the rest of the crew wouldn't have troubled themselves with, getting me extra helpings of rice and beef while Curry had his back turned steaming away his brains over the cooked stove. My dearly beloved brethren and fellow citizens, having traveled over a considerable portion of these United States and having in the course of my travels taken the most accurate observations of things as they exist, the result of my observations has warranted the full and unshaken conviction that we, colored people of the United States, are the most degraded, wretched, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began. And I pray God that none like us ever may live again until time shall be no more. They tell us of the Israelites in Egypt, the Helots in Sparta, and the Roman slaves, which last were made up from every nation under heaven, whose suffering under those ancient and heathen nations were, in comparison with ours, under this enlightened and Christian nation, no more than a cipher, or in other words, those heathen nations of antiquity had but little more among them than the name and form of slavery while wretchedness and endless miseries were reserved, apparently in file, to be poured out upon our fathers, ourselves, and our children by Christian Americans. These positions I shall endeavor, by the help of the Lord, to demonstrate in the course of this appeal to the satisfaction of the most incredulous mind, and may God Almighty, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open your hearts to understand and believe the truth. The causes, my brethren, which produce our wretchedness and miseries are so very numerous and aggravating that I believe the pen only of a Josephus or a Plutarch can well enumerate and explain them. Upon subjects, then, of such incomprehensible magnitude, so impenetrable and so notorious, I shall be obliged to omit a large class of and content myself with giving you an exposition of few of those which do indeed rage to such an alarming pitch that they cannot be, but be a perpetual source of terror and dismay to every reflecting mind.